Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, we are going to take you through some basics in designing accessible OER. This is not meant to be a compliance workshop uh, on the legal side of things. We are really focusing in on faculty and professional staff creators of open educational resources. Um, we're going to start off with Tiffany, who's going to take you through an introduction and a word run through, and then I'll go through PowerPoint and some uh, stuff near the end. Uh, I'll pass it right over to Tiffany. Okay, um, so a quick introduction to um, who we are, though. Um, uh, my, my name oh, yeah, is that Tiffany. would be good. Yeah, my name is Tiffany. Uh, I'm Program Manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. Jeff? Yeah, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the Program Director for Affordable Learning Georgia. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. No, um, good call. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk through some accessibility stuff and then we'll jump into workshop. Um, so why accessibility? Um, so the your open textbooks, they're open to download, your open resources, they're open to use, revise, remix. Um, but open like licensing isn't necessarily open enough. It's not open in access unless you're making it accessible. So accessibility fights discrimination um, in access to information for people with different abilities. So keeping in mind, like, we, we wanna keep in mind that when we say different abilities, we don't necessarily always mean disabilities. Um, it's, it's really everyone's abilities and, and sometimes preferences too. So, um, so but as far as um, what we might call disabilities go, um, we have uh, accessibility is going to make it easier for seeing, uh, see, uh, I'm sorry, people with seeing uh, disabilities, hearing disabilities, um, different mental abilities. Um, and so in Georgia, um, our accessibility organization, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's totally, I'm totally blanking on their name, uh, Center for Inclusive Design Innovation, I'm sorry. Um, their requests typically come from people with learning disabilities. Um, we definitely get um, a whole range, uh, I mean, that's pretty standard across the board. There, there is a huge range of students, a huge range of people that access our materials. Um, but the usual like outright requests are coming from students with learning disabilities. So how much accessibility is enough? Um, so giving you a checklist, it's not really enough, right? It, it, it's not really gonna be um, the, the right the exact things that you need, um, and and they may in, and it may not be the exact things that someone else needs. So, um, because it does vary as far as uh, what you're creating, who your audience is. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that it's not about legal compliance; it's about equity. Sure, there is a legal compliance component that relates to accessibility, but that's not the reason that we want to do it, right? Um, so accessibility is a spectrum. It's not a binary switch. It, uh, it, you want to build from the start with accessibility in mind. There are some basic ways to do that and that's what we're gonna cover today. Um, we're gonna show you how to do it. You're gonna be able to follow along. It's gonna be great. Um, there are some sort of higher level lo uh, components to accessibility that we don't necessarily have the capacity to cover. Um, and so some examples would be braille print on demand, um, audio description of uh, visual video elements, accessible computer hardware, um, print magnifiers, those kinds of things. A lot of the time, those are things that, uh, with the exception of the audio description, so braille print on demand, accessible hardware, print magnifiers, a lot of the time those are things that your students might actually be using. And so there are things that you can do to help make sure that their use of those things are working. And these basic things will actually help with that. So to get us started, um, to get set up for the, this workshop, um, go ahead and turn full screen for Zoom off. 
we're going to actually have you split your screen between Zoom and the downloadable um, uh, follow along documents. So in Sketch, there were three uh, linked documents. Uh, there was a button to our PowerPoint, and then there was a link to a Word follow along and a link to a PowerPoint follow along. We're going to start with the Word one. You can go ahead and open both if you want right now, but um, we'll start with the Word one. So we want you to split your screen with the Zoom on one side and the Word on the other. And we will sort of go through all of this together. You'll follow along with us. Um, all that stuff will be accessible after the presentation too. So if you feel more comfortable watching and then going back to practice later, that's totally fine too. Um, and if you have two monitor monitors, it's even easier for you. So a quick tip, um, I guess your, your first tip, word accessibility tip, you want to structure your document. So screen readers, um, which are tools that your, um, uh, your visually impaired students, your, um, you know, some learner, some, uh, students with different learning abilities. Um, really anyone might be using these screen readers because a lot of students do actually like to listen to your lecture rather than watch it and listen to your content rather than read it. So screen readers are gonna do that, but they need structured documents. Um, and that sort of allows you to jump between different sections um, in the document. So think about if you were using a screen reader and you and that was the only way you were accessing, you couldn't read it for, for whatever reason, and you're trying to get to chapter 12 of a textbook with no structure. That's kind of hard, right? Because if there's no structure, your screen reader is just going to read it word for word with no explanation of where headings are, um, no explanation of where uh, page breaks and chapter breaks and things are it gets kind of complicated, but we can make it a little easier on them. So to create a structure document in Word, um, you're going to use the styles grip, the, the, the styles panel in Word. So um, pulling up our example document, the styles panel shows up here at the top. I actually like to open it on the side. I find it more helpful to look at it this way. Um, so that st the, the styles panel um, gives you tons of different options. You can even create your own styles. And I find that a lot of people will do that. A lot of people will create completely new styles. But as far as accessibility is concerned, you're a lot better off using the heading styles that are there and just changing those ones to be the way you want it to look. So there are ways to change the way it looks. Um, you can even change it in your document first and then right click it and there's an option to say modify uh, modify heading style to match selection and it will make your heading style match that so that all of your headings follow it. And that even helps you when you're trying to change your style mid document. Maybe you decide last minute that you want to change the color of your headings. Um, you could do it all with the styles panel and you would only have to do it once. Um, so one habit to kick though with this, you want to create a document structure on, I'm sorry, you don't want to create a document structure on site alone. So we don't want to take a, a line of text, change the color, make it bigger, bold, without using the heading styles. So we, a lot of the time we'll like write our whole document out and then we'll highlight what we want to be the header and just hit bold. That doesn't make it a header, a, a heading. So it's important to use that style and then you can use whatever color sizes bold that you want to make it look nice and it will, it will have that heading structure. So our first exercise. <clears throat> so in our practice document here, um, we're all actually working in the same one, I just realized. <laughs> um, so you might be better off to follow along since we're, uh, we're all looking at the same one right now so that you can follow along. Um, as soon as the first person changes something, they will, um, 
uh, it, it's gonna change it for everyone else. So that's no fun. For you to follow along on your own, I would recommend saving the, saving the file as a separate document on your desktop and work in that one instead. Um, it'll make it a little bit easier to follow along without having us all um, working in the same one. And I'm actually gonna do the same. Um, so I'm going to save this to my desktop, save, and I will pull it up there. Ooh, my desktop's a mess. Where is it? This one? No. Uh, what was it called? There it is. Sorry, guys. All right, so in this practice document, um, here are our instructions. So I want you to, using the styles feature, we're going to change the first lorem ipsum, uh, the, the big one, or, or, I'm sorry, not the big one, the one that would be our title, lorem ipsum colon the ipsuming to a title using the styles feature. We're gonna change chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three to heading one. And then we're gonna change chapter 2.1 and 3.1 to heading two. That's to show you how the structuring works. So we want to nest our headings. If there's a subheading within a heading, then you, you bump down one heading level. Keep in mind that these are not numbering your headings, it's leveling your headings. So if something should be at the same level as something else, then you stick with the same number on those. So let's start with that. We switch over to our Word document. We have our title. We want to, you can highlight the whole thing, but you can also actually just click on the line. And if you come over here and say title, it's gonna change it to the default Word format, right? But let's say we don't really want it to look that way. Maybe we don't like it. You can actually come over here, click the arrow, modify, and you have all these options at your disposal for changing the style. The other option that I mentioned earlier was to change this to how you want it to look. So maybe I want to change this to Open Sans and I want to make it size 16 and I want it to be purple. Okay, so I've done all this stuff, but it's still not a title because we don't have, title is not selected. If I come over here and I right click title, you can say update title to match selection. And so it's gonna update it in that way. If for some reason there was another title in your document, which there shouldn't be, you should only have one title. But if for some reason there was, better example would be a heading one and we wanted to make it that, it would make it match automatically. So we'll do the same for our headings though. Um, and I won't uh, go too far into detail of changing these, but we want our chapter, uh, our first level chapters to be heading one. So we'll change all of those. And notice this one's a 2.1, so this is the next level, and we want this to be heading two. And notice it looks kind of similar, but a little different to heading one. Um, that's typically what you want to do is make your different levels look different. So we're back to a level one and a level two. And I think that's it for headings pretty easy and it's pretty helpful for if we had gone through this document and then and we'd done all of our headings and suddenly we decide well I don't really like the way heading one looks oops go back we could come here okay so we'll we'll do check heading two um I'm sorry ignore that the <laughs> Jeff can you take over that's nutmeg she needs to go out I'm sorry oh that's the dog doorbell Okay, um, let me uh, quickly move over. I will share my screen. Here we go. Believe you me, I know exactly how that goes. Uh, I am going to quickly copy this one. 
bring it out here for a second. Part of my cluttered desktop. Get rid of this. There we are. All right. Got my little copy open here. Good. And let me just make sure that I can see. So y'all can hear me, right? Okay. And here's my video. Hi, everybody. Okay, good. So let's keep going from here. I am going to go through these slides a bit here. There we are. So we've already done the uh, document structuring thing. So now what I'm going to show you uh, is this. So let me just quickly go here. I'm going to uh, use the full screen and just open up my styles here. Um, going to go title, sure. Go in here, heading one. Go in here, heading one. Two, one. Heading two. This is all a Big Lebowski reference, by the way. This is a Frankenstein reference. And heading two. So now what I'll show you is you go to view and you hit navigation pane. And over on the side, you now know what a screen reader can do. It can jump to a chapter that's outlined in the structure. So here's chapter one, here's chapter two, here's chapter 2.1, here's chapter 3.1. Let's say I wanted to be fancy and make a print version of this book that had a table of contents to it. I could go into review, I believe. No, no, no. It's a uh, I believe it's insert. Nope. Wait. Yeah. It is somewhere in here. Tiffany, do you know where to add the table of contents to this? It's almost kind of hidden. Oh, it I'm is sorry. an insert? Uh, no, it's actually on references. Sorry. Got it. Right. That is an unusable title for a ribbon thing. But yeah, here's a table of contents put in the automatic table, and I've got it. Chapter one, chapter two. And it'll update if you refresh it so that you know exactly where these uh, page numbers are. I'm going to get rid of that, though, because we don't need this for your usual thing. There's no table of contents to update. Of course there isn't. I'm deleting this. Yeah, there we go. Cool. All right. Uh, do you want me to switch it back over to you, Tiffany? Um, you can, if you want to keep going, you can, and I can do PowerPoint, or we can switch. It's totally up to you. Um, I'll, I'll just take over from here and uh, we'll move you over to PowerPoint. Sounds good. Yeah, cool. Adapting on the fly, everybody. I see chat, so I'm going to quickly look at this. Aha, uh -huh. so the reference tab. Yep, everybody knew it except for me. Awesome. I try to edit a PDF in Word using the navigation pane. It was a pain in some ways. That's a good pun, too. Yeah, um, PDFs are structured a little bit differently. We always recommend going from Word to PDF, and we'll get into that a little bit later, too. Uh, Christina Hendricks, um, OER superstar. I love you, Christina. It is a huge revelation for me when I learned about the navigation pane. So easy for navigating long docs. Awesome. Uh, Tiffany McLennan says, how did you view that navigation tab on the side? You go to references and, okay, well, no, no, no. You go to view, <laughs> then you go to navigation pane. Sorry, I'm combining all of my directions here. Yep. Very cool. All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, I have little notes about LibreOffice. If you use LibreOffice, that's awesome. If I w went into it a little too much here, we take all day. But LibreOffice is a cool alternative. It is not a proprietary uh, uh, word processor slash uh, uh, slide presenter. So it's really neat. Uh, Word accessibility tip two, uh, you can tell Word about your lists. So screen readers, when they're going through a document, they recognize when there is a list because lists are tagged as a part of the structure. It's kind of like if you're making a website and you start a list, you're like, here's an unordered list. It's the UL tag and then you make your list or you have an ordered list. Here's one, here's two, here's three. Uh, so when you do this, uh, just make sure that you're using the bullet point icon on your home section of the ribbon. Uh, it's a pretty easy one to do here, but I'm, I'm showing you why this is kind of uh, weird when we get into our exercise. If you don't like the design, you can change the design of the bullets using the drop down arrow. Sometimes it winds up a little weird, but it's still, it's a lot more accessible than if you were to 
do this old habit that a lot of us have of creating lists with a hyphen at the beginning or uh, just doing numerals and not having Microsoft structure it, um, having just a, a couple of spaces and then you put things in. Word might still look at this and say, hey, you have a list here. We're gonna, we're gonna change this to a list. Uh, that's good, go with it at that point. Um, but yeah, if you just have something with, uh, that looks like a list, but it isn't tagged as it, it won't display that way. So here we go. The next one, ah, is there something like the navigation sidebar in LibreOffice? I am not a good enough LibreOffice person um, to know whether or not they have a navigation pane, Jonathan. That's a really good question. It's something that I would like to look up. Um, okay, so Patricia says, if you type an asterisk and it converts to a bullet point, uh, will that get tagged as a list? Yes, if it converts to a bullet point, that means that Microsoft is taking your thing and saying, this is a bullet point, therefore you have an unordered list. And we're going to do all of this at once. So uh, the third tip here is making sure that you tell Word also about your table headers. So tables are uh, kind of notorious, especially in the web world for being inaccessible. And if you cannot use a table, if you could do like a, an ordered or unordered list that gets the same point across, I'd rather suggest that. But if you have to have a table, um, when they're used for tabular data, make sure that you show what your headers are. Uh, screen readers will read these differently if they have the headers because then they know, okay, each column has its own thing. Otherwise they're gonna go uh, cell, 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 left to right, move down, left to right. They're gonna read off each row. Uh, so, the way to do that is to use your table styles. You're gonna designate a header row in the top left corner. Um, make sure that uh, you can repeat the header row on every page. Uh, so we're gonna move into that in a second, but there are some habits here using tables to arrange all of the content on your Word document. It was a neat thing in the 90s to go, oh, I can use a table to make stuff look like there's uh, separate columns and oh it's pretty now you don't want to do that uh, because then your screen reader is going to absolutely uh, divide it up into ways that you hadn't thought about um, and then of course making sure that you're creating real headers instead of just ones that are using bold or larger text kelsey says guilty of that in the 90s i would say word processors were guilty of that in the 90s as well uh, microsoft has come a long way on accessibility they had a really great access uh, ux designer who was focused on accessibility uh, she um, wrote a book called mismatch it's real neat uh, she worked with google and microsoft at one point um, and yeah there's a whole table menu in LibreOffice too and it's really powerful so you can just set everything up right from there I, I really like that uh so the other thing is making accessible hyperlinks and that's the we're gonna do all these at the same time um if you read out a direct url like the one that i put at the top of this chat uh which was brusg.sharepoint.com slash colon w colon slash g slash team underscore uh, sites slash Galileo slash E W X O Y. Like I could read that for a very, very long time and have absolutely no idea what it does. Um, if you highlight some words that describe the URL and attach that URL to them in a hyperlink, that will let a screen reader know exactly what it is. So if you have a list of links that the screen reader reads, you're not going through a list of weird hyperlinks that have a whole bunch of like garbage words and letters, but also you're not having non-descriptive tests like this link, click here. Because if you do that, then it's gonna say list of all links on the page, this link, click here, here, there, this thing, that like you really don't want that either. So you want to make sure you're describing where it is you're going on that hyperlink. Um, so like this link, not good. Click here, not good. Creative Commons homepage, pretty good. So exercise two, we're gonna make a table accessible. We're gonna make a list accessible. We're going to make links accessible. So first of all, chapter one, we're going to take that uh, weird bullet point list and we are going to turn it into an accessible unordered list. So 
I will get rid of these hyphens because we do not need them. Going to highlight this, go back home, hit this bullet point, and here we go. We have an unordered list. Boom, accessible already. Um, instead of this kind of bullet, we could change it. Uh, we could have something like this. Oh, I missed one. Aha, thank you, Cynthia. There we go. Good catch. And we could even change it to these four diamonds or a check mark. Um, just make sure that you've got a pretty clean bullet right there. Nope. I don't want to give away the PowerPoint. Uh, now we want to turn the inaccessible table in chapter two into a table with headers that repeat on the next page. Tiffany says you can even make custom bullets. Yes. And it'll still read it like an unordered list. So that works really well. Uh, so we're going to go into this table, get some headers that repeat onto the next page. So here we are. As soon as I click on the table, Word knows that we are in a table. So we're going to go up here. And we're going to say, okay, so this is the header row. So we'll set that. We have a header row. Now I'm going to make that bold because I like it, right? Or what I can do is go over here and say this one. Now let's say that I had formatting going on and I no longer uh, want those formats. Um, we could go over here and change this to white. There we are. Uh, could even highlight this up. Hit this one. There we go. Um, so one thing is done, right? But this is not the end. Because if I scroll to the next page, I don't see those uh, headers anymore. So I'm going to right click here. I'm going to go into table properties. And I'm going to go here and go repeat. So this is table properties, row repeat as header row at the top of each page. So there we go. Perfect. So now we have the header row here. And if we scroll down here, got the header row right here too. Now we've got uh, this hyperlink here. It says, this is the Laura Mipsum generator, colon, here's this thing. So I'm going to just cut out this entire URL going to highlight, this is the lorem ipsum generator. In fact, what I'm going to do is just highlight lorem ipsum generator. This is gonna work a little bit better on a screen reader. A little less words gets the same point across. And I've got the pasted URL right into here. And I can change that colon to a period and I've got it. Oh, all right. So that is an exercise that took all of those tips and did one quick thing with it. So here's an accessibility tip that's not just in Word, but absolutely everything we use. If you have images, um, those images will be read in a screen reader as image. And if those images have information in them that is not getting across to people who only can use screen readers to access that information, you are discriminating uh, on access to information based on ability. So we need to make sure that our images describe what they are to screen readers. And the way that we do that is by um, adding alternative text to an image. So if we, have, uh, if we have an image that's a little squiggly line at the top of a page that's just there for decoration a screen reader doesn't have to read that thing. Uh, if I'm somebody who is trying to get some good information out of chapter two, I don't need to know that the author or the designers put a squiggly line at the top of the page. Um, it'll just, if you can mark it as decorative, that's fine. If you have zero, usually fine too. You can mark things as decorative in Office, so that works very well. Um, but yeah, it's important that you only do this when the image adds no value except decoration to the page. So if something looks like it's decorative, but it also has a little bit of info in there, you still have to use alt text to make sure. Uh, so here we go. I'll show you uh, a little bit about that. I hear, how do you mark as decorative? So if I go into here and I just 
find this picture of a kitten. Of course, it's a kitten, a bunch of librarians at Open Ed, right? Uh, I'm going to right click this and hit edit alt text. And I have blocked my alt text with the zoom features. So I'm going to move them for a second here. Now let's say that this was a little squiggly line and had nothing of value. We can mark it as decorative and move on. That way an accessibility checker won't come in here and say, here's an image without alt text. You can say, no, 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 this is decorative. We don't need anything else. But we want to describe this picture because it has something to add to this text about lorem ipsum and a cat. So we don't want to be subjective about this. We don't be like, oh, look at that cute kitty. So cute. I wish it were a little smaller on the page. Uh, because all of that is criticism that a screen reader really doesn't need to take into account. You're not providing anything new um, to a reader when it comes to this. You want to describe what's there. Think about it like you're posting a tweet. You don't want to go too much further than one to two sentences. Even Microsoft says that. So I'll say uh, photograph of a striped kitten um, licking its paw on a soft white bed. Aha, okay, so Christina says on a Mac, you can't find the mark as decorative box. Mac office is weird and I'm not exactly sure how to navigate the difference there. If somebody uses a Mac and uses Mac for office and knows how to mark as decorative, please let me know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm in the Windows crowd, unfortunately, uh, where the USG is kind of a Windows shop. So how is it read? Do you need to type images of or photograph of in the alt text? That's what Kelsey says. So if I said a kitten and the alt text reads it off as image, here's the thing. Now that would be a little bit weird, right? If I said image, image of this, because that's redundant. But let's say that you want to distinguish what kind of an image it is. Uh, a drawing of a striped kitten licking, licking its paw on a soft white bed, um, a vector art image, uh, a cubist painting. Um, instead here we have a photograph. So I'm describing that it is a photograph in order to give that information to the person on this. Uh, if you're in a photography class, that would be super important. Uh, if you were in an art class, that would be super important too. Oh. Uh, April says, my version of Word on Mac has the same mark as decorative below the box, just like Jeff showed. Uh, Christina says, I was told there is a max of 150 characters in alt text. That is not the case. You can use uh, a lot of text in alt text, but it depends on the platform. Um, you may even have a content management system in your website that says you can only use this, this many. So that's, yeah, it, it really depends. Oh, Tiffany says, you may need to update Word. So yeah, I've added alt text here and it'll say image and it will read this off. Um, so make sure that you're not just throwing images into uh, any kind of file or any kind of uh, resource without having or without describing that with alt text. And Microsoft is starting to get pretty good at uh, detecting what it is. It used to be that their automatic alt text would always say a picture of a phone. Now it doesn't always say a picture of a phone. In fact, I've shared pictures of Rocket doing something and it'll say photograph of a black dog eating something. And I'm like, how do you know this? How do you know about Rocket? All right, so I already did the adding the alt text to the image. Uh, in LibreOffice, you right click the image, you go to options and you fill in the alternative text only bar. Now, what about PDFs? So we already kind of talked about this one. Um, oh, wanna show them how to turn off the auto alt text. You know what, Tiffany? I don't know how to do that. Can you guide me through it? Sure. Um, so so uh, Jeff mentioned how uh, Microsoft does this auto alt text thing. It's turned on by default. Um, and so sometimes it throws off your accessibility checkers because maybe you forgot to do the alt text, but Microsoft has put something in there and maybe it doesn't make any sense. Um, so you can turn that off. Um, if you go to file and options down at the very bottom, and we're gonna go to ease of 
Uh, maybe it's not ease of access. Let's look there first. Yes. Oh, there it is. Automatic alt text. And then you go, there we are. Yeah. And that turns it off for you. And it should Excellent. save for future documents too. Very cool. I like seeing how it, how it works. So, and how it's improving over time. So I will keep it, but that's a really good thing to know. Aha. Uh -huh. Salt Lake Community College uh, offers a YouTube video that demonstrates how screen readers work by a vision impaired reader. Uh, CIDI has one too. It's, it's really neat to see how it all works, particularly if you're using something like JAWS, which is just really powerful and fast and, and readers have to take in a lot of information very quickly. Uh, so I'm gonna keep going here. Uh, so the last thing, um, try to move your PDFs uh, from Word to PDF and not the other way around. You don't want to retrofit uh, a PDF because PDFs use a completely different language when it comes to marking what things are. Word knows to convert those over into PDF okay. Uh, PDFs going into Word, not so much. Uh, so here, I would just go in here, go to File, Save as Adobe PDF. Yes, I've got an Acrobat PDF maker. Um, yep, right. So I want to hit Options. And in Options, you want to make sure that Enable Accessibility and Reflow with tagged Adobe PDF is uh, selected. Those tags are the structure tags. They're really going to happen. Uh, they're really going to help. Um, I've got a question from Sarah Sweeney that says, what happens if we use InDesign uh, to PDF? Does the screen reader get any information from it? It gets the same kind of information that you put in on the Adobe side of things. So if you have a whole bunch of bookmarks, uh, those bookmarks sometimes convert to Word and sometimes they don't. It also depends on the structure you have on those bookmarks. I've seen uh, InDesign PDFs come back to me with absolutely mangled text. Um, our, our university press, which is really cool, the University of North Georgia Press, they started by designing things in InDesign because they are a print shop and they still do it on the, on the print version end of things. But now they start in Word with us thanks to a partnership between us and them and a partnership between Tiffany and uh, the managing editor over there. Uh, so, we, we've gotten them to start with Word first over there uh, to make it much more accessible. Oh, Lauren has a really cool YouTube video too. Jonathan says, does Pressbooks export to PDF make accessible PDFs? I do not know because I don't use uh, Pressbooks, but I would absolutely guess that yes, that's the case. Ask Steel Wagstaff, he will be able to get all into it. Um, is there a difference if you save the document as PDF and choose print and then choose the printer Adobe PDF? Yes, most of the time. Uh, sometimes there are options that let you at least have optical character recognition when you're printing it out, but some print to PDF features, depending on what it is, they might print those out as images and then your screen reader won't even know what the words are. Yep. Google Docs to PDF is not so awesome either, <laughs> considering taking course collaborative project from Google Doc to Word to PDF, wow. Interesting. Okay, I do want to move on so because we do not have too much time here and I'm, I'm squeezing uh, what we've got for Tiffany, but uh, the PowerPoint exercise is a little bit smaller. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Okay, let me pull mine back up. Okay. So, um, and I'll just add here that I seriously recommend that you keep it in Word um, rather than converting to PDF uh, if you're going from Word to PDF, just because um, the Word documents can be, uh, they tend to be better imports into accessibility uh, technology. Um, so like students using um, the, their like braille readers and things, um, uh, Word works better for that kind of stuff. Okay, so PowerPoint though, um, same kind of setup. So turn off your full screen, um, split your screen between Zoom and the presentation this time. So you're switching over to the PowerPoint that we provided. Um, and, it, and again, if you're going to follow along, save that PowerPoint to your uh, computer and that way you can um, actually edit it. I think the link is uneditable. So save it to your computer, open it there to be able to follow along. 
Um, and I should have put this tip uh, on at the beginning too, but um, if you're on a PC, you can snap windows to half the screen. Um, if you hit the windows button, so it looks like a little window and then an arrow key, it will pop it to the right, to the side that you tell it to. Um, that should, I should have put that at the beginning, sorry. Okay, so PowerPoint accessibility. Um, tip one, reading order and layout. Really, really important. So PowerPoint layouts, what they give you to begin with, those are the styles of PowerPoint. So those layouts that they provide are gonna give you, they're gonna define a slide title, which is really important for accessibility. That's like your heading. Um, it's going to uh, set your reading order for you. Also really important because a lot of the time, because PowerPoints aren't completely linear documents, um, the reading, reading order can get really jumbled up if we're moving things around on the page. Um, so we want to use layouts. Um, it's the best way to set your reading order in, like set it correctly. However, there is a way to set that reading order manually if you wanted to get fancy with your PowerPoint. It takes a while um, because you have to do it piece by piece. And uh, so we're not gonna cover it here, but if you're interested, we can chat about it later. Um, so the easiest way to do, to keep your reading order in place is to start with your blank presentation, use only the layouts, fill in all of your information into the PowerPoint without changing your style yet stick to your layouts um, and keep it blank. And then at the end, you can use the design ideas feature, which is a really handy um, and actually really nice feature because it takes, instead of using those PowerPoint templates that you've seen a thousand times already, it creates new ideas and it, it updates all the time. Um, so we get new stuff all the time. I think we had a PowerPoint uh, recently with a coffee cup on the screen where the steam actually like moved when you were presenting, it was really cool. Um, and that came out of design ideas. And the nice thing about design ideas is that it keeps the reading order in the right order. It keeps your titles marked as titles. It keeps all of those features the way that you set them up when you uh, built out your PowerPoint. Um, and then you wanna test it out. So there on the view window, um, so there's a, a view tab on the ribbon. There's, you can click outline view and you can check to make sure that everything reads in order. Um, and if it's not, then maybe you need to take another look. It's really just important, it's really important to just not be throwing uh, new things on the slide that didn't come with the layout. And so like, if you add a new text box here, just dump three images in there, that's really gonna mess up the reading order. So um, let's do an exercise. So the PowerPoint that we gave you, if we switch over to that. We are going to um, first just look at the slide, okay? Open up, open up your outline view first. So let's go over here. I'm gonna open the ribbon here. So Zoom is blocking it. Let me hide this. Okay, we're going to go to view. And we want to see outline view. And is it Jeff, am I missing something? Is it supposed no. to be? No, so that's it. All that's all that's right in there is the title. You can't see any of the text because somebody did not use layout. Yeah. So I, sorry, I got confused because I thought it would show it all in the wrong order. <laughs> sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here, the only thing that's in the right order is the title. So we want to fix that. Um, so we're going to come, let's go back and look at our instructions. We want to go back to normal view and fix the reading order for the slide. By first right click the slide select a layout, and then put the elements in there correctly. So if we come back here, we're gonna go back to the home tab. Oh, let me first close the outline view. Go to normal. Go to home, let me pin this so it doesn't go away. 
we're going to click layout and we're going to choose a layout and we have a few things here on the slide so i'm going to pick this two content layout and notice it like added some boxes here but it didn't really do anything to what we have so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this this text box and i'm going to highlight everything in it i'm going to cut it and then i'm going to delete this text box because it doesn't belong there instead we're going to paste it into the box that that it provided. Notice that the title automatically went into a text into a title box because it didn't give us a new one to write in. I'm going to open up the other one that's the other text box here that's kind of buried. We're going to do the same here. And we'll delete that text box. Come in here and we'll paste it. And we'll do the same here. Cut this out. Uh, oh, it did. It. There it goes. Okay. Delete that text box and paste it in here. And I'll get rid of this extra bullet here. Our image, then we're going to cut our image, click in our text box. And if you paste, it will replace your text box with the image. Notice that the design ideas actually popped out for me once I filled in the layout. But that's not all we're going to do. Okay, so we've done the layout. Let's look at the uh, reading order. Okay, this one. Let's go back here to view, outline view, and it brings up how it's going to read it. Okay, so it's got our text, it's got our, uh, I mean, our title, it's got our text, but where's the image? That's because our image doesn't have any alt text, so it's not going to read it. So let's give it some alt text here. Um, a golden, I should put a photograph, sorry, a photograph of a golden retriever with his tongue out at the park. Okay, descriptive, simple, accurate. And it's not, I did something wrong. That might be because a uh, two content uh, layout, you would have to add that photo as the second content in the content box. Otherwise that's an image that's just uh, hanging out. But also- It is in the content box. Oh. That's weird. Well, I, the thing that we were talking about was whether or not you use alt text to make stuff readable if you're using images to convey stuff in PowerPoint or not. And I said, if you're just using images in your, uh, your speeches or your lectures, um, use the speaker notes because notes will, uh, basically your, your class, if they're using a screen reader, can access the speaker notes and read them that way. Trying to find where I usually I do I do reading order a different way. Oh, okay. But I forget where it is. There's another way to look at reading order that will show you the image. Um, I just can't remember off the top of my head how to do that. Um, oh, I think it's the uh, order of objects. That's a, a different thing here. Maybe it's arrange selection pane. There it goes. All right. So under arrange and then selection pane, it will bring up um, how your things are viewed. You're going to read them from the bottom up, though. So your title is always going to be at the at the bottom. That's fine. That's the first thing. And then it's going to read content placeholder one, and then it's going to read content placeholder eight for some reason. Um, <laughs> But, and you can also change the names of these. So um, we can double click it and change it. Um, it's not necessary right now, but this is another way of looking at reading order is from arrange and then selection pane. And you can move them. So let's say we wanted our image to be read first. We can move that down and do it that way. That's the manual way. Um, all right, let's try to get through the rest of this. Um, 
So the other thing is that you want to uh, you you can use the slide master to fix color and font issues. Um, so if we come over here and let's uh, get it back into normal view. Um, we're actually going to stay on the view tab and we're going to click slide master. And so here we can um, set our we can set our uh, styles. So we're using the two column layout. So we're going to use the two column piece here. And we can set these to the uh, styles that we want it to be. So let's say that we want this to be, um, I'll pick something just so that it's not taking us so long. Maybe we want our title to change to this. We could also just go right through uh, how to fix the colors and the hyperlink, mm -hmm. and then I think we're good. Yeah. Um, and so we'll close this, and it didn't do it for some reason. Um, okay. So we yeah also, we might have to manually fix that one. Yeah. We also need to um, fix our link though. Notice that this link is not only really hard to read, but it's also inaccessible. And so we want to. Um, take this, we should change the color to something more readable. I don't even like that one. That's too light still. It's like a dark blue, but we also need to just make this accessible anyway. So we're going to take this out. We're going to highlight, where did this go? I forget. This goes to just a golden retriever page. So it's okay yeah. to use that. <laughs> So we're going to highlight this, make this our link, same way that you did in Word, and make it accessible. Of course, it changed the, the style again. Um, but if you use the slide master to change this before you start creating, then yeah. it'll be great. Yes. You can set all I of usually, these in the slide master. If you go up to the top, the first one, uh, the first, uh, uh, I'm trying to it's the first layout uh, on the page, the top layout. Yeah. That's the master layout. And then you can fix everything up here and it'll apply across. Yes. <laughs> I actually, I hate the master slide if I'm being totally honest with you, but I know <laughs> that there's a lot do. you can do with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, sorry, I know we have one minute left. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> so we'll change the color though, just make it pretty and we will move on. <laughs> Okay, colors and fonts. Um, videos, use a script. Um, that's that's our tip here. That will help you get accurate captions without having to go back and edit them piece by piece. However, you can, if you are opposed to scripts, you can put your video in YouTube, let it do its auto captions and then edit it. Um, there are actually some instructions for how to do that on the speaker resources page from OpenEd. There are also instructions for how to do that um, on mm -hmm. our website, um, which we will put a link to in the chat and also um, in our sketch. It's not there right now, but we'll add it. Yeah, and in our slides, um, if you want to check these out later, that's totally cool. We have some things on um, overall accessibility checkers, uh, websites, but really if you're, um, if you're, if you already did what we did today, but on the web, you're most of the way towards making an accessible, uh, web page. And so there's just some checkers on there, uh, some good links as well. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Tiffany, for uh, going through the second half pretty quickly. Uh, I think because we're so focused on the textbook side of things a lot, the lesson side of things, uh, focusing on Word was was pretty cool. And we wanted to uh, adapt on the fly and respond to your questions. So I think that that was probably, hopefully, the best approach. Let us know if you don't. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please contact both of us. Uh, I'm Jeff Galan at usg.edu. Tiffany is tiffany.reardon at usg.edu. And thanks for joining us, everyone.
Thanks Thank everybody. you so much. I, I'm, I'm going to turn off the recording, but this room can remain open if people want to do some interactive question and answer. Yes. Here we go. Thank you very much.